Greetings, friends, enemies, and frenemies. It's time to move ahead on the discrete audio amplifier design and build project. I'm sure some of you have been waiting since I haven't made an installment video for a while, but it's time to do it. So in the last video, I got the thermal stability figured out. Really happy with it, putting the drivers on the heat sink. How little the uh, bias current changed as the amplifier warmed up. It was very stable, didn't vary around too much. So now I have to think about redesigning the layout of the amp. I have the schematic here. This is pretty much how the schematic is going to work out. Now it is missing a few components. It doesn't have the short circuit protection showing on here yet. The thing is, I don't want to deal with that until I get the amplifier up and running because the essentially the, the short circuit protection just sits there and does nothing while the amp is operating normally. It only activates when there is a excessive current detected. So it doesn't make sense to uh, put that circuit on the board at this time. That will be designed in an upcoming video. I'm to the point where I can get an actual board built and an amplifier working. Get some uh, you know, preliminary tests going. So here is the nearly finished schematic of the amplifier. Again I'm not showing the short circuit protection. That will be an additional 10 components that will be added to this. Uh, one item I need to figure out here is this capacitor value. This is connected between the base and collector of the Class A transistor in the voltage amplification stage. And this will uh, aid in uh, what's known as phase stability. It's part of you know keeping the amplifier stable. But we'll look at phase compensation and all that good stuff in an upcoming video. So here is the layout I came up with previously and this is not going to work anymore because I want to put the drivers on the heat sink since it works much better for thermal compensation. So now I have this layout and uh, it's changed a little bit. I've, I think I made things a little bit better. But the main thing here is I'm putting the output transistors on each side along with the drivers and the VBE multiplier transistor. The reason I'm doing that is so I can easily get it on the board. Plus I have this idea I'll run by you real quick. So what I envision here is having some aluminum plates made about six millimeters thick which is around a quarter inch and this will be the board. This is just a quick sketch I'm not showing all the components and the transistors would mount off to the sides like this the outputs the drivers and the VBE multiplier right here so this will make a nice compact design so for example if you had a board and you had the heat sink here and the L-shaped configuration you know this takes a lot of room but if I do this configuration everything's mounted up to a board you don't have to worry about drilling all these extra holes tapping them for the heat sink you'd only have to worry about these two holes because of course this board would be mounted onto this aluminum plate with standoffs and then the the heat sink that'll be all done you know this is considering this makes it to kit stage so it'd be a nice compact unit doesn't take a lot of room you bolt it up to a heat sink kinda like an STK module in a way as far as uh, building actual amplifier, this would make it a lot easier. And it works a lot better with the thermal stability. Plus having the drivers on the heat sink, I'm not as concerned now about driving lower impedance loads and worrying about... Before I would have to buy little heat sinks for these drivers and then have them on the bill of material. So yeah, I, I think this way is a much better way to go. So if this thing does make it to a kit, I can still offer the board only. I can offer the board only, but with components. Or I can do, uh, 
you know, the aluminum plate with the board, no components, or I can do the whole nine yards with all the components, board, and the aluminum plate. But for now, whoops, I'm going to knock the camera. So now i got to put it on this perf board. Of course, the final design of the amp, I'm going to have boards professionally made, but, you know, i got to get this prototyped and, uh, you know, get the thing working first. So i got to put it on the uh, solder perf board. Let's take a closer look at the layout here. It may still have mistakes in it. I went through it. I think everything's good, but there still might be some adjustments, of course. This is going to change. I'm going to use the TO220 output transistors on the prototype board, but in the final design, I'll be using those larger TO264, I believe their uh, K style is. So it's actually going to make this bigger, plus I'll have to fit the uh, short circuit protection parts of this in here. So yeah, this is going to change, but this is what I'm going to use for the prototype. So yeah, we have the output and the drivers here. These are the uh, emitter resistors on the outputs. And I have this coil wound around a resistor. I want to keep all this stuff over here and away from the smaller signal stuff. So I, I laid it out so there is some space to keep the uh, high current magnetic fields away from the lower current areas. Here is the VBE multiplier circuitry. This is the class A in the VAS stage. This is the current source on the top of the VAS stage. This here is the uh, power supply bypass capacitors. And this is where a lot of the star for the ground and the power supply come in. So I have the output running out on its own line and it stars into the uh, positive rail here and the smaller signal stuff runs out on its own line so it's fed from a signal that's been bypassed with the capacitors. I have uh, the electrolytics here and the ceramic. I'm going to use ceramics here because of the excellent low ESR properties of them. Uh, same on the negative rail you have large signal stuff and uh, small signal uh, rails going out. And of course the ground. I have power grounds, you know, the high current grounds. And over here is the small signal grounds. That kind of runs out. I, I ran this out around like this kind of to shield this input stage stuff. Plus I can run another line out and over like this. It just helps with the shielding though the way it's mounted to the heat sink can also help with the shielding. Uh, what else do we have? We have the um, filtering for the current sources here. They get their bias supplies from a clean filtered circuit. So we have the current source for the input stage over here. I um, already mentioned the current source for the VAS stage. And the input stage and its current mirrors are over here and some input stage components. So yeah, I think I have a good layout here, decent enough. Try to minimize any jump overs. You can see there's jump overs here. I did have to jump over some lines in a couple areas. So there's only three on this board, so I minimized any of the jumping. If I have boards made, it's going to be single-sided. I don't really see the necessity for double-sided with this layout it's it's clean enough simple enough that I shouldn't have to do much jumpering but there might be some more when I have to put the short circuit protection in we'll get to that when the time comes a couple questions about transformers I think I might have covered that in an earlier video but the amplifier is designed to work with a 25025 type secondary in other words a 50 volt center tapped secondary. How much current would you need? I would say 3 amps per board or 150 volt amps. Now depending on your needs you could lower that or increase it. I would think it'd be overkill to 
go much higher like 4 amps which is 200 volt amps per board now if you're going to run 8 ohm loads you can go down probably to a 2 amp secondary but it's up to you it may impact the the actual power the amplifier can make it all depends on the power supplies as to how much power the amplifier would make I will say up front that I do not recommend using it with a higher voltage than a 50 volt center tap transformer because after you rectify and filter the AC current you're going to end up with rails that are plus and minus 35 volts I decided on a 50 volt center tap transformer because the other voltages were harder to find I started out with an amplifier that could deliver 50 watts per channel at least that was the design goal but it's harder to find those transformers so going with a uh, 50 volt center tap transformer the amplifier probably will be able to hit 60 watts per channel with 8 ohm loads before any sort of distortion or clipping and maybe up to 100 watts or more with 4 ohm loads and again that's because you can find 50 volt center tap transformers are very common so it makes sense just to go with that well this is where the rubber is going to meet the road in the next video you know I gotta now solder this board together this is going to be the first working amplifier I'm going to put a signal through it going to put music through it will the thing actually work so it's a very very big point in this amplifier design will this thing work that's what I'm concerned about and I have some other issues too. I really don't have good equipment for testing the distortion. You know, normally you see me use my oscilloscope here. I use the FFT or spectrum analyzer mode on the scope. Because it's an 8-bit scope, you can only see down to 0.4%. However, with oversampling of this oscilloscope, I can see down to the 0.2% peaks which is good but it's not good enough especially if I want an amplifier that can deliver below 0 0.01 you know I'm more than an order of magnitude too high and at 1 kilohertz I'm hoping this thing goes down to 0.001 percent that creates a problem for me how can I test these things I know I can hook up my computer and get much better than my oscilloscope can but I can't measure higher frequencies due to the limits of the sound card. Some people says, who cares because you really can't hear that. Well, the problem is there is potential for intermodulation distortion to generate different signals from the uh, beyond hearing range of frequencies that show down in the audible range. Without having a spectrum analyzer that can do, you know, say up to 500 kilohertz, I'm very limited in my ability to measure distortion. I looked in eBay for audio analyzers and things like that, and I, I can't lay out $700. It's not going to happen. And some of those new audio analyzers are very expensive. Uh, you know, you're talking uh, several thousand dollars. So I am running into an issue of testing there are some things I can do I know I can set up and measure the amplifier one thing I'm looking at doing is taking the input signal and the output signal and leveling them and differentiating them and that'll show any content that's not there in many cases that's how some of those audio analyzers work by uh, differentiating the signal you know you take the signal that's going in the input and you compare it with the output if there's any difference in that signal the amplifier added it of course the amplifier made that signal much bigger but any other change that the amplifier makes to that signal is going to show up as a signal and there's a lot more to say about that and I'm not going to say it here I will mention that in an upcoming video well, I guess that's all I'm going to say. I just wanted to bring you up to speed what's going on with the audio amplifier project. Uh, what do you think about the aluminum plate design? I think it's pretty neat. And like I said before, this is where the rubber meets the road. This, i got to get the perforated board and lay out the prototype on there and see if this thing comes to life for real. 
Well, that's it. Thanks for watching. What's the problem here? What you squeaking for? Huh? What you squeaking for? <laughs> you want me to open that door and let you out? You're not allowed out. Walk, walk back and forth. <laughs>